Hello and welcome back to the 8-Bit Guy. This is the fourth and final of a documentary series about Planet X3. And it's going to be a long one, so you might as well settle in. Since it's been a while since the last video on the topic, I want to show you a timeline of events. I started development in November of 2017. Now, two months later in January, I released the first video. And then four months later in May, I released the second video and simultaneously started the Kickstarter. Another four months went by and I released the third video documenting the development process of the game. And so what's happened since then? In the last video, I was showing off the newly implemented VGA mode, and it had this pink background behind all the transparent objects because I hadn't implemented the transparency yet. So before I talk about this, I want to point something out. Um, originally, I had only planned to support CGA four color mode and CGA composite mode. And that's because I really wanted to bring a real-time strategy game to the original IBM PC and clones like the Compact Portable. Essentially, I wanted to target the early MS-DOS era computers since almost no new software is being made for those machines. So the goal was uh, the game would run on a 4.77 MHz XT with CGA. And not just run, but run at full speed, look good, and still be fun. And if I couldn't add a feature and get it to run fast enough, then I'd just have to leave that feature out. And honestly, I was perfectly happy with the game being a CGA game. I mean, for what I was trying to do, especially being that I had the composite mode for color, which I thought looked plenty good enough. And the only reason I added Tandy mode early on was that I realized I could use the same artwork as CGA composite mode with minor tweaks to the palette. Well, people kept demanding that I add VGA mode, so uh, grudgingly I did add support for VGA, but that also required adding some transparency. If you look at the CGA graphics here, we basically just used a neutral background color for the tanks, builders, and aliens. In most cases, it blends in well with the background, but in other cases, you can see it just barely. Uh, for example, on the Inferno map, you can see a black outline around the unit, but it isn't that noticeable. And in the composite mode, you can see a small color clash around units, and it's more noticeable with the aliens. But with VGA mode, there's simply too much color and detail, and so the only way to make it look presentable was to add transparency. Well, this turned out to be a challenge for speed. Uh, DOSBox is very handy when trying to see where your code is running slow. I set the cycle count down to 50 regularly for testing, and in this case, I'm going to set it down to 10. Of course, no actual PC was ever this slow, but one of the things this allows me to do is watch it fill the screen. Um, now watch what happens when it gets to a tile that has transparency you'll notice it's considerably slower. And that's because it has to essentially read two tiles and merge them together. Uh, so it was important to use the older, faster drawing routine for any tile that didn't require transparency. And that's another thing the routine has to do, is check the tile it's about to draw against an internal table to see which routine to use for each tile. Also, it's possible to turn it off in the menu, which will help speed up the game on slower PCs. Of course, you'll have black areas around all of the units. I think it's important to understand when playing this game that while the VGA graphics look nice, and of course it plays fine on a 46 or Pentium computers, um, the appearance is just like fancy dressing for what was designed as a CGA game for the original IBM PC. So while it really delivers a great gaming experience on XT based computers or especially early Tandy machines, I feel the game somewhat under delivers on later DOS machines because I think when people played on those machines, their expectations would be higher, especially considering how nice the graphics look. Uh, but they're still playing something with the gameplay that was optimized for a much slower PC. My job on the Planet X3 development team was not only to compose a soundtrack that would fit with the game, but would also work with the sound hardware that was given. That sounds like it might be a fairly easy task on the surface, but in reality, there were quite a few challenges involved. In the last video, I showed the plan for using three different sound devices, uh, the PC speaker, the Tandy 3 voice system, and the AdLib. And we figured we could simulate three voices on the PC speaker by arpeggiating them, uh, basically alternating back and forth very quickly to give the illusion of more than one voice. And to make the music easy to port between these systems, we decided to just use the first three voices of the AdLib card as well. That way all three systems would play more or less the same three track music. 
And we'd also plan to use three more voices on the AdLib for sound effects when using that device. And then for the PC speaker, it would alternate between playing musical score and playing sound effects. And the Tandy chip would also rely on the PC speaker to act like a fourth voice, which actually works out really well on those machines since it's mixed and comes out the same speaker with the three music voices. However, in the end, we ended up scrapping the sound effects for the AdLib and just relying on the PC speaker for sound effects no matter what music device the user selects. I was already quite familiar with writing with the kind of hardware that would make it into the game. For example, I basically know the AdLib in and out, and I have a decent level of familiarity with the Tandy's SN7 sound chip. So, when David announced Planet X Free in January of 2018, I immediately hopped on the chance to do music for it by sending him and Anders an email, and after some demos and some talks, I got approved. Now, I did get a lot of negative comments and pushback over the concept of using just three voices on the AdLib, but uh, I think if you take a listen to some of the music that Noah composed on all three devices, I think you'll actually be impressed. sounds better than most people expected has to do with the way the ad lib was used back in the day. You see, back then the music was often designed for the Roland MT32 first, and then they designed a routine that would take the MIDI information and then try to play that on the ad lib or Tandy or other sound cards, and so the music was rarely ever optimized for the ad lib. Interestingly enough, I actually asked Noah to compose the music on the Tandy chip first, because I figured if it sounded good on the Tandy, then it would probably sound good on the AdLib. Then Noah tweaked the soundtrack individually for each device to try to get the best sound out of each one. And it worked out pretty well. Uh, despite using only three voices, I think our soundtrack sounds as good or better than most 80s games that were using all of the AdLib voices. One thing that a lot of people thought was going to be a bad limitation, and actually ended up not being trouble at all, was that I was limited to just a couple voices on the ad-lib as opposed to all nine, and those were free melodic voices like the Tandy, and then drums. Now, this ended up not being a problem for me, as I'm already quite used to working in very limited environments, and, well, this wasn't anything different for me. It would have been nice to access all of those channels, but I probably wouldn't have used them anyways, as even a lot of my original ad-lib compositions don't use the extra channels for anything but just echo or reverb effects. Surprisingly, the PC speaker ended up being a really easy one to do, and this is because I basically just took the Tandy version and then stripped a lot of the stuff out. So drums went over everything to lay down a basic rhythmic pattern, and then you had the melody, and then you had the bass. However, this wouldn't have worked had I not kept the PC speaker in mind when making all the music, which is why so much of it is so melodically driven, because, well, atmospheric and drone stuff and stuff you'd hear in a lot of CD audio games just it doesn't work well on the PC speaker, it's too simple. I'm also very proud of the fact that Planet X3 natively supports the OPL2 LPT, which is a modern sound device being sold by Certishop, and I also sell them in my store uh, for USA customers. And these are basically ad-lib cards that plug into the parallel port of a regular PC. Now, the thing is, it requires a driver to work with games, and uh, as such, it requires a 386 for the driver to function. And so that means there's no way to use one of these on an XT or a 286. But since Planet X3 has native support, no driver is required, so you can get ad-lib sound working on just about anything with Planet X3. And of course, the soundtrack cassette that comes with the game also includes the MT32 and Sound Canvas versions of the main music. And while it doesn't come with a game, a vinyl record is also now available with the soundtrack as a separate purchase. Just like with Planet X2, Anders Jensen was in charge of designing the layout for the boxes, manuals, cassette inlays, and disc labels. 
let's have a look at how we designed all the elements for Planet X3 and also did the music. So after we got Renault on the team, we asked him if he wanted to do some designs for the cover. He sent a few suggestions, which you can see, and they all look amazing. And after a little back and forth, we ended up with the final design that you can see here. We all agreed that the uh, intense pink colors should be toned down to the more pleasing yellow hues. Designing the box was easy because uh, David wanted to use the same size and shape as the Planet X2 box. Which meant that I could just duplicate the Planet X2 project. I use Adobe InDesign for desktop publishing purposes. And since Renault delivered a complete design, I could just put it on the background layer and add elements on top of it. These are the guides that would tell me where the design would fold around the part of the box. So I basically just added the uh, logos on the side and front and the fake sticker. And the bottom part is almost identical to the front. Just a little bit smaller so that it can fit inside the top lid. I played around with the text and the pictures until I came up with the final design. Here's a quick composite of the box and the floppy disks, which David needed for his initial Kickstarter video. It's not always so easy to preserve the colors when you're dealing with different print shops like we did, but I figured the default settings should be sufficient for our need. And this turned out alright for the box, but not so much for the manual, as you'll see later. We used a local US company called the Custom Boxes this time, and they were cheaper than the original company, but it also meant that David had to assemble all the boxes himself. The work with the manual required that David and I had to use a shared Google document. This way David could write all the content for the manual, while I could focus on implementing the parts as we went along. And here all the different components are separated into layers, text, graphics, pictures, design elements, backgrounds, etc. First I spread the text across all the pages. And then it's time to add the pictures and illustrations. And this is a tedious task, because you have to consider text wrapping and kerning issues around the pictures. And then I figured Renault's early design could be used as headers for chapters. Renault had also made some high resolution graphics of his tile sets used in the game. These I cut out into separate images so that I could assemble them myself and make illustrations where needed. Each element was painstakingly adjusted and assembled one by one. Maybe not the best way to do things, but it worked. And finally, some of the pages needed some color to give them a little bit more depth and texture. One issue that we had is that we wanted to use the same type of manual that was included with Planet X2. With this design, you basically have a bunch of pages that are stapled in the middle. Now, the problem with this design is that it can only accommodate so many pages before it becomes too thick for this. At that point, you'd have to go to a different type of spine. Another problem was we wanted to make sure that the full maps were included, but since they are spoilers, we got the idea to split it into two separate manuals. And this solved both problems, because now the spine was much thinner on the main manual, and this second manual contains a lot of tips and tricks for a better strategy, along with all of the maps. There was one little drawback in the process. The print shop who did the manuals did not send me any profiles for the printer. And since they were all printed in the US, I could not verify the final product until it arrived at David's house. So that's why the colors in the manual are more purple than the blue color they should have had. It was many hours of hard work, but it was also rewarding to see the, uh, the final product take shape. It was really fun to work with the other guys on the team. And hopefully we manage to create a solid product that everybody can enjoy. One other important thing about the box and the manuals is that uh, all of these had to be designed and sent off for production before the game was even actually being finished coding. Now this was a problem because that meant that uh, tens of thousands of dollars were being spent on materials for a game that wasn't even complete and runs the risk of maybe not even becoming complete. Not only that, it also kind of tied my hands because once the manual's written, there's a lot of things that simply couldn't change in the game, otherwise the manual would be wrong. <laughs>
When I made Planet X2 for the Commodore 64, my biggest uh, constraint was RAM. And I knew that when I moved to the IBM PC that RAM would no longer be a problem. But the one thing I didn't anticipate was how much problem disk space was going to be. Obviously, just like the C64 version, I wanted to fit the entire game on a single disk. And there are many reasons for this, from everything from cost to time to produce, and of course simpler code if you don't have to deal with disk swapping or hard disk installation. I didn't foresee this being a problem. On the Commodore disk, they were single sided and only held 170K per side, and I had to fit everything on one side. On the MS-DOS version, I wanted to ship the game on both 360K and 720K discs, so even the 360K version offered over twice the space since they're double-sided. But there were a number of things working against me. Uh, for one, the maps themselves are somewhat larger than the C64 version. and Also, the graphics set on the C64 was so simple, the entire thing only took 2K, and that's because I was using redefined text characters there. And even the CGA version of the game used a 16K for the graphics, and that had to be multiplied many times for all of the different types of landscapes, such as grassy, winter, desert, and so forth. And then uh, there are all the different graphics modes, and they have their own graphics set. Too. Uh, so this really became a lot of data to store. What's worse is we had this intro sequence Renault had worked so hard on and uh, this also had to be done in three different graphics modes. And unfortunately, it became pretty clear towards the end of development that this was simply not going to fit on the 360K disc. Uh, Jim Leonard had added a fancy compression routine to the game which helped to shrink all the files down. We also decided to leave off the VGA graphics from the 360K disc since we figured most machines with VGA would have the 720 or 1.44 megabyte drives. But the problem is it was still about 10% too large to fit on the 360K disc. So in the end, what I had to do was remove some of the maps. So the 360K version has nine maps and only supports CGA and Tandy graphics. And the 720K version has 13 maps in all of the graphics modes available. Uh, fortunately, we knew this early enough so that the disc labels actually reflect that. So you can see the 720K version shows CGA, Tandy, and VGA, whereas the 360K actually just says CGA and Tandy. As for the intro sequence, uh, we just threw that up as a standalone video on YouTube uh, with voiceovers by LGR and Techmoan as a little treat. So at least people would get to see it. We could only hope that Protoids aren't here on this planet. We also incorporated the pictures into the manual like a little comic book. So I wanted to say something about doing crowdfunding for anyone considering it. Uh, finishing Planet X3 turned out to be rather stressful. Um, suddenly I had over $100,000 deposited into my account, and for me that's a huge amount of money. Uh, now you might think I would be rolling in the dough and be like Scrooge McDuck or something, but I knew that most of this money didn't belong to me. It was meant to pay other people and pay for the materials. So this is where things become really stressful. Now, there were several times I ran into some programming roadblocks. There were at least two occasions where I thought I might not be able to finish the game. And uh, during one of these points, um, I actually had already spent a lot of the Kickstarter money on materials, and the deadline for completion was just looming around the corner. And um, I was really in a panic because um, I no longer had the money to refund everyone if I had to d abandon development on the game. Um, fortunately, uh, in both cases, Jim Leonard was able to come to my rescue. David first contacted me November 20th, 2017. That was his first email to me asking for help with 8086 Assembler. Uh, he and I had conversed a little bit over the years. I was a fan of his channel and helped him out with a couple of technical uh, pieces of information. Uh, I'm a patron of his on Patreon. And he knew me because uh, I, had, I was a co-creator of the 8088 mph per hour demo, which won uh, the revision old school demo compo in 2015. So he was aware of my assembler knowledge, and he contacted me to ask uh, what was a good way to get started with 8086 assembler. And I originally uh, went back and forth with him a little bit about various tools he could use, and then one of the things I mentioned was A86, which is this very simple uh, but capable assembler of taking uh, a source file and uh, assembling it directly to a COM file, so you just immediately get to assemble and run and it ran on the original hardware. So I thought he would use A86 to make a couple of test programs and get up to speed and learn about the memory segmentation and things like that. Things that were different from the 6502. Imagine my surprise when in about February of 2018 he emailed me stating that he had already coded up 
a basic tile editor with CGA support and he was asking me some more advanced stuff like now how do I save stuff to a file and things like that and I was kind of like time out man pump the brakes <laughs> because I had recommended A86 to him as like a learning assembler like a teaching assembler. Uh, A86 only supports com files it has no uh, decent debugger it has a debugger but it's not that great it has no profiler uh, no library management no exe support which means no multi-segmented uh, memory binaries and i you know i don't i was like i just a86 was to get you started but he was already off and running like a shot and uh, for those of us who know and love david know that when he gets an idea in his head he is off and running and there's not very much that you can do to stop him um, but that's a good thing because that tenacity drove Planet X3 all the way through from conception to final product. And in an era where I was reading the other day that in 2018, uh, roughly one out of every 10 Kickstarter projects actually gets funded and pushed all and fulfilled and, and completed. In an era like that, uh, David's stubbornness, for lack of a better term, uh, was exactly what Planet X3 needed and became a to become a successful Kickstarter product. Obviously, in the end, the game did in fact get completed, but the Kickstarter uh, was a bit of a double-edged sword. So while it did add an enormous amount of stress to me, um, it's also what helped push me to work through the problems so that I could eventually get the game completed. Otherwise, I mean, it was either complete the game or have to go into debt trying to refund everyone who had bought the game on Kickstarter. When the game was close to completion, I decided it was time for some beta testing, and I wanted to bring in some people to play the game who'd never even heard of the game before, and um, I wanted to sit there and watch them play it. So I invited one of the kids that lived down the street to come over and play the game for a while, and I stood behind him with a pen and a notepad to take notes. This was a very surprising experience. Within the first few minutes of playing, he had already found like 10 new bugs that I wasn't even aware of. And I mean, he was trying to do all kinds of crazy things that had never even occurred to me to try because I already knew that doing those things, you know, wouldn't work. But uh, I didn't realize that doing those things would cause all kinds of crazy things to happen in the game. I can't remember all of the bugs he found, but one, for example, uh, had to do with the abort feature. See, many units, uh, when they're busy, you can press A to abort whatever routine they're running. Uh, well, he had somehow pressed the A key while he was selected the power station, and so it stopped generating power. And it actually took me a while to figure out why he had run out of energy and it didn't seem to be producing anymore, despite having a lot of solar panels. And so that was an example of something that would have never even occurred to me to try. But it wasn't just bugs that my beta testers found. Um, I watched numerous people come over to my house and play the game, and one of the things I continually saw was uh, several people had trouble with certain aspects of the user interface. Uh, for example, the game has something called browse mode. Uh, basically, when you press the enter key, it will pop up this browse selector where you can select another unit. And at that point, uh, the keyboard no longer responds to any commands until you've finished selecting something. But uh, people continually brought up the browse mode and then tried to keep on playing and thought the game was locked up. So one of the things I added was just a simple error message that says not in browse mode <laughs> when you try to do something. And uh, this way people could figure out what the problem was. Uh, such a minor change made a big difference. Another problem was people complained that it was too difficult to aim at the enemies because they moved too fast, but uh, slowing them down was not an option for other reasons. So as a compromise, I added a feature for the tank where you could just press space and it would automatically fire at the nearest enemy unit. And if it didn't find any enemy units, then it would revert to a manual mode so you could select something to fire at. And um, I added the M key where the user can force a manual fire. And uh, all of the beta testers seemed to really like this feature. Another problem was that people kept selecting objects to build, but there was no way to abort this. So basically, once you selected something, you had to build it. Now, my beta testers wanted a way to abort without building something, and this was actually one of the most difficult changes to make and probably required three days of coding because I had to change the very nature of the way commands were transferred from one subroutine to another. Uh, however, you can see that it is now possible to press escape during this process, and it will abort. 
Another problem I saw is that many of the maps were just too difficult for most players because there was too much open area to defend, so I ended up changing a lot of the maps to add more natural boundaries like trees, rocks, and water around the starting positions, which made things easier as there was less area to defend. All of these things had a dramatic effect on the overall playability of the game, and even though I wasn't able to implement all of the changes that my beta testers requested, I think most of them were pretty happy with the end result. I was disappointed that I didn't get to include any easter eggs in Planet X2 due to RAM limitations, but uh, for X3 I managed to fit quite a few of them in. I'll show you just a few of them. I always liked how Ultima games allowed you to press the number keys at the main menu to hear the different pieces of music without actually you know, playing the game, sort of like a jukebox. So I added that feature to Planet X3. And it works in all sound modes, even the PC speaker. Also, on almost every level there's an easter egg of some sort. Uh, like here's a little secret Commodore shrine. <laughs> and uh, on this level you'll find the TARDIS hanging out. You can even pick it up and carry it around. Anyway, I won't spoil them all for you, but uh, there are a lot of little things like this scattered throughout the maps. I thought writing the code was going to be the hardest part of Planet X3, but it actually turned out that production was the hardest part. I can say without a doubt, uh, the biggest problem was the boxes. Uh, when I had ordered the boxes for Planet X2 a year earlier, these came pre-assembled like this. But the boxes I got this time came flat, like this, and so it required folding them. And at first it seemed like a good thing because they take up less space for storage, but uh, I didn't realize how long it was going to take to fold all of these. In fact, I timed it and working at my fastest, uh, I could only fold about 28 boxes in an hour. But I had 2,400 boxes to fold just for the Kickstarter. Another problem is that about 1 out of every 20 boxes were defective in some way. These boxes appear to be just two layers of cardboard glued together, but some were just missing glue, and so they just split open. And uh, the other problem was a lot of the boxes had what appeared to be spilled glue or something on the outside. And fortunately, we discovered that some Windex would actually clean these up with some scrubbing without actually damaging the matte finish. My wife and I spent several hours per day just folding boxes. Now, I even had some fans of the channel, such as William, um, offer to come over and spend the day folding boxes with us. And I even had a box folding party where we had multiple people come over and just fold boxes all day. And I spent most of the day running the box hospital, and that meant uh, adding in glue and then using clips to hold them together while they dried. And I really appreciated everyone's help, but uh, the sad part is this accounts for probably 25% of the actual box folding. Uh, my wife and I did the rest. Uh, duplicating the discs was also a challenge. Um, originally I had wanted to include both 720K and 360K discs with each box. And I never actually promised this, but it was still my goal. Uh, but that meant almost 2,000 of each disc, or 4,000 discs to make. Anders had found and sent me about 3,000 of the 720K discs. One problem with these is they don't have write protect notches, so you can't actually write to them without taking a piece of paper like this and sticking it over the hole. Now, I tried modifying a USB floppy drive so that it would ignore the write protect, but uh, all I ended up doing was destroying the drive. Uh, so we just used post-it notes for each disk. The 5 and quarter inch disks had their own challenges. Uh, for one thing, finding disks with blank sleeves was getting harder and harder, especially in quantity. So I contracted with a company to produce custom disk sleeves with my logo on them. And I also put a cute little warnings on the back of the sleeve, just like they uh, used to do back in the 1980s. But um, another problem with writing 360K disks is that you need a vintage computer with a 360K drive. You might think you could use a 1.2 megabyte drive, but you can't. Uh, the problem with these drives is the head is half the size because there's twice as many tracks on a 1.2 megabyte floppy. Now, uh, these drives don't have any problem reading a 360K disk with their smaller head, but writing them uh, produces disks that often won't read in a 360K drive. Uh, so that meant having to use really old computers to make these. We also had a disc copy party where people brought over all kinds of machines and we just spent the whole day making discs. Labeling the 720K discs was a challenge for some people. When I ordered labels for the 5 and a quarter inch discs, I just bought them in an off-the-shelf size that happened to fit pretty well. After all, there was never really a standard size for disc labels on discs like this. 
But when I went to order labels for these, they needed to be an exact size. Well, none of the companies I called seemed to have a size on file for floppy disk labels. And while I know these are obsolete, I was just surprised to find that no one still had the size, you know, on file anywhere. Anyway, I had to measure the spot myself and tell them how many millimeters it was. And I think I might have gotten them just a bit too large. They actually fit, but there is no room for error. So it takes somebody with a very steady hand uh, to apply these and stay within the lines, so to speak. Uh, many of the people at the copy party gave up on labels. I think me and Chris were the only ones applying labels to the discs. So uh, some of the guys uh, told me they played a prank on me and that they actually put one of the labels on upside down. However, I have never found a disc with an upside down label. So it is possible I shipped it out that way. So I'd be curious to hear if anybody received a copy of Planet X3 with an upside down disc label. Despite the huge number of discs we made during the copy party, this was probably only like 20% of what was needed to fulfill the Kickstarter. I realized I was never going to be able to do all of these and deliver the product on time. So I required people to choose one format or the other for the Kickstarter fulfillment. Interestingly enough, I thought it would be roughly a 50-50 distribution, but it ended up being more like 90% 720K and only 10% for the 360K. However, since making the game available for sale on my website, I do offer the box with both disc types, but it does cost extra. Despite that, nearly 90% of website orders have opted to pay the extra amount and get both disc types. Shipping for the Kickstarter began on February of 2019. Shipping was also a big problem for this. I was constantly getting emails from people asking me to, you know, update their shipping address or some other special request. People just didn't understand. Um, I had a system that would print off shipping labels directly from Kickstarter every day and uh, we just filled the orders. And if I tried to keep up with all the special requests, I'd have post-it notes everywhere like in the movie Bruce Almighty. So I had to keep telling people to go back to Kickstarter to change their address and other things like that. Despite our efficient system, I was spending about eight hours a day shipping packages for almost two months straight. And my wife would come home from work and spend an hour or two shipping stuff with me. And despite this, we could still only get about 50 packages shipped out per day on average. And I think we worked together one Saturday and managed to ship around 180 packages that day. This was one of the most stressful times of my YouTube career because I had totally underestimated how much time it was going to take to you know, fold the boxes and produce the discs and ship all the packages. So I was thinking I could get this done in two or three weeks, but it ended up taking three months to do. And during this time, I struggled to produce any content for my YouTube channel. And I went from making like around six videos a month to around two instead. Of course, a lot of people kept emailing me to make suggestions that I should upload videos more often. <laughs> uh, but another big problem I had was with returns. Um, I spent $22,000 shipping out um, all of the original packages. But uh, I've had somewhere around 30 or 40 of them so far come back as undeliverable. I think most of them have been from the UK. And uh, so I contact these people, let them know their package has been returned. And most of the time, they weren't even aware the package had arrived because their local post office never informed them. Uh, so they get sent back. And uh, now if I ship them again, it costs me $22 for each one of these. So I have to ask that they pay the shipping because I can't possibly afford to pay for all of these returns. And I have piles of these just sitting around in the house because a lot of these people just never responded, so I don't know what to do with them. And to make matters worse, I still have, as of today, 52 people who have yet to fill in their address on Kickstarter. So I can't even mail them their packages, and they aren't responding to emails either. So if you're one of these people, <laughs> go fill in your address so I can ship your product. Storage space has also been an issue. My house was completely filled with boxes related to Planet X3 materials, and I even had to use part of my parents' garage to store the materials, and the space needed ended up being a lot more than I expected. So just a word of warning for anybody thinking about doing a Kickstarter. It is not a walk in the park. It is a huge amount of work. After the game had already started to ship, we made at least four changes to the code, which means that different people will have received slightly different versions of the game. Now, granted, most of the changes are very minor. For example, we discovered that the Commodore PC compatibles, like the Colt or the PC-20, would actually lock up and simply not work at all. Uh, Jim Leonard tracked down this bug quickly and modified the code so that it would run on these. 
And there are still probably a lot of discs that shipped out with this bug, but as far as we know, the bug was unique to the Commodore hardware, and so unless a person were to run the code on one of these, they'd never have a problem. Jim also added a nice pixelated transition screen between the menu and the game screen, which works in all video modes, and uh, this wasn't on the original release. And the last minor change was the Game Over screen. Originally it just said to press any key, and the problem with this is that sometimes players were still pressing keys trying to fight up until the screen appeared, which would then cause the game to jump back to the main menu without them ever being able to see the game over screen. I had already added a check so that it would ignore cursor keys since those were the most likely keys to be pressed. But Jim decided to take it further and change the in-game screen to say press M to the return to the menu, uh, since the M key isn't really used for much else during the game. Uh, probably 50% of the discs that went out just say press any key, the other 50% say press M. But the most significant change would actually occur after production had already began. Uh, Benedict Friesen actually emailed me back during the development stage asking me if I would support the Plantronics Color Plus mode. For those that don't know, uh, this was a CGA video card that also had some nicer 16 color video modes, similar to the Tandy series but not actually compatible with the Tandy. Uh, several clone machines included support for these modes, especially clones sold in Europe. Uh, the Commodore line of PC compatibles is an example of one that supported these modes. However, little to no software was ever written to take advantage of these modes. In fact, the little demo program that came with the computers was about the only thing most people ever saw of the 16 color graphics mode. So despite having 16 color graphics, the Commodore PCs would have to run Planet X3 in the regular four color CGA mode. And while I thought the idea was cool, I ultimately decided not to support it because uh, for one thing DOSBox doesn't emulate it, which would make uh, developing it a lot more difficult. Uh, the other thing was I just didn't want to put in the time for such a small audience of uh, users that might actually you know, take advantage of it. However, Benedict kept pestering me about it even well after production had began, and so finally I offered to just send him the source code and ask him if he wanted to add the new graphics modes in there, and well, believe it or not, that's exactly what he did. And it works perfectly. Uh, you can see it here running on the Commodore PC-20-3. And now there is a catch here. Uh, the mode he is using is 320 by 200 pixels with 16 colors, but we didn't have any artwork for that. Uh, using the four color artwork would make no sense. Uh, using the 256 color artwork would be really difficult to down convert into something that looks nice. So he decided to use the Tandy low res artwork, which is only half the resolution of the mode being used. So everything is scaled up by a factor of two, which means this could in theory look a lot better. In fact, Renault made a little mock-up by hand of what the game would look like running in native on Plantronics resolution. And it looks pretty nice. Of course, this is also what the Tandy mode would have looked like if we had gone with the medium resolution mode instead. And of course EGA also supports this resolution and color combination, so this mock-up could easily be for any of those modes. So if that wasn't cool enough, uh, Benedict wasn't done yet, uh, he emailed me back a few days after he had that working and apparently had added a few other interesting features. Uh, he added an interesting twist to the CGA mode where it could operate in grayscale. Ironically, this doesn't work on most CGA cards, but it does work on a lot of EGA and VGA cards. I actually like the look of the grayscale CGA. It's quite a pity the original hardware didn't support this as it's easier on the eyes than the magenta palette. However, looking at the three sets of artwork we had, he realized he could adapt the 256 color artwork for Tandy high res mode. Now this mode is double the resolution but half the colors and it takes up exactly the same amount of RAM for either mode and is laid out in RAM more or less the same. So he came up with a dithering pattern that allows the VGA version to run almost perfectly in high res mode on a Tandy. Now the low end Tandy machines don't even support this mode and even if they did they'd be too slow to really use it. But on the later model Tandy machines like the 1000TL for example, it looks fantastic. Also, since EGA also supports a mode with the same resolution and colors, he also adapted it to run on EGA cards using a similar method. However, a separate executable was now required for the EGA mode. So anyway, I'm thrilled with the work he did, and I'm very proud that Planet X3 will now run on so many different video modes. And uh, I really love seeing all the various computers people have tried running the game on. There were a few things that were essentially left unfinished, but I didn't think they were important enough to actually do a mid-production uh, uh, code change. 
One thing is there's way too much contrast between the grass and sand tiles on the desert map. Now the surprising reason for this is because I only ever designed the map editor to work in uh, CGA composite mode. And in this mode, the contrast is acceptable. In fact, the VGA tiles were drawn long after this map had been designed. And this just goes back to what I was saying before, that this game was developed primarily as a CGA game. Now, I had planned to redo the map, but never got around to it. Another similar problem is with the jungle map. In this map, the trees and brush are so thick that you have to bulldoze your way through to explore and to eventually combat the enemy. The trouble is, the order of some of the tiles in the tile database were changed after the map was finished, which ended up causing this map to display the wrong tiles. So there are all these weird patterns that weren't really supposed to be there. Anyway, I didn't consider it to be enough of a problem to redo the map, and so far nobody's even mentioned it. Alex Semenov, who designed the sound and music routines for Planet X3, is also working on porting the entire game to the Sega Genesis. A lot of progress has been made, and the game currently runs, although a lot of features are still missing. By default, it uses the VGA artwork, which has had the colors reduced. But one interesting feature is that on the menu, you'll be able to select CGA or Tandy graphics if you want to experience those modes. And for sound, uh, you'll be able to select the Tandy music, which makes sense being the Genesis also has the same sound chip as the Tandy alongside its FM synthesizer chip. So that's pretty cool. Uh, no word on when this will be finished, of course. Even though I consider myself more or less finished with Planet X3, there are still two things I have left to do. At some point or another, I want to create a shareware version of the game, where it basically just be a cut down version that plays, you know, maybe like only one map. Uh, that way people can share the game freely and try it out on different hardware platforms and see how it runs or see if the game might even be of interest to them. The second thing I want to do is at some point I want to open up the source code and make it available. And uh, there's two reasons I want to do that. Uh, one reason is I think people might end up adding more new features to the game, which I think would be cool. Uh, but the other reason is, I've noticed there's a lot of people out there who are also trying to write their own MS-DOS games, and it is a struggle sometimes to figure out um, how to work some of the video modes or how to even accomplish certain things in assembly language. And it would be good to have some example source code out there uh, that's well documented, which Planet X resource code is very well documented. So uh, that's something I want to do in the future as well. And uh, with any luck, that might actually spur the development of some other new games. And uh, But... Um, I appreciate all you guys sticking around for this rather lengthy episode, but that's all I have for the moment. So um, subscribe if you haven't already, and um, as always, thanks for watching.